Uh, good morning, everyone. It is almost half past, and it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to our first panel session. This one is the devoted, devoted to relevance and irony. Uh, and we've got three speakers. Our first speaker is Agnieszka Piskowska from the University of Warsaw. Uh, Agnieszka is, uh, Agnieszka's talk is about words as carriers of irony. Uh, we still have got a minute, so probably we we'll, oh no, it is half past sharp. So I think I can safely give the floor to our speaker, to Agnieszka Piskowska. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Maria. Thank you uh, very much, everyone. Uh, for, for coming to, to this session. And I will now uh, try to share a screen. We can see it all right. You can see it all right as, I don't know if it's the, the, the sorry, maybe I should have, um, it's, it's, is it the presentation mode? I'm, I just no. wanted to make sure that I'd be able to change slides, but... Um, so I, I don't really know if I can do anything about it. Uh, Just right. change it to the slideshow mode, if you can. Yes, but uh, I'm not sure I can. That That's exactly because then... So you need to probably uh, abandon sharing and then open the presentation in the slideshow mode and start sharing again. Uh -huh. Oh, it's our great pleasure to see Professor D.D. Wilson with us. Wonderful to see you. Okay, so I'm just uh, trying once again. I'm sorry for uh, for this, uh, but... Um... Well, this is an important thing for everyone now to follow the kind of procedure that you open your presentation in the show slide. In the slide show. Yes, but no, I can't do this because then I, I just can't see. It. Okay, so whatever. Not uh, it's it's probably um, then I can't see that the zoom. You know, the the zoom screen uh, disappears. So I will just um, okay. I don't think this is uh, hugely important because I don't have any special effects anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, yes. Okay. So. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I can hear str some some strange uh, strange um, effects. So I, I'm not sure if they come. I've just, from... I've just muted people who weren't muted. So hopefully that should help. Yeah, can everybody please mute themselves, or I'll try to mute everyone. Thank you. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, well, here's the title of of the presentation: words as carriers of irony. And I would like to stress that this is about like uh, single words that might. Uh, uh, um, carry irony. Uh, now I have changed the slide and I hope everybody, everybody can see that I have done so because sometimes it uh, doesn't happen. So I'm just checking whether you can see the second slide. I hope so. Yes, okay. we can see all of the presentation. Yes, good. Uh, uh, so uh, the goal of this presentation is sort of modest because I would like to offer an account of irony uh, signaled by the inadequacy of a single word as, for instance, and I'm uh, quoting this example from uh, Wilson 2006, um, as I reached the bank at closing time, the bank clerk helpfully shut the door in my face. So as we, as we can notice, the, the only inadequate or, or ludicrous uh, word is the adjective helpfully, because the, the rest of the proposition is, we can say, used descriptively. It, it corresponds with the state of affairs. And uh, this, is, this can be contrasted with irony signaled by the inadequacy of the whole proposition, as in, we all miss face-to-face -face faculty meetings if it, if it was used ironically by, by somebody. Now, the question is why such utterances that is the signaled uh, by, by the uh, inadequate use of, uh, of a single item, why do they merit attention at all within relevance theory? 
Well, um, uh, I, I feel very happy that you know I, I don't have to uh, um, revise uh, the um, uh, relevance theoretic treatment of irony in full in front of, of this audience, but I, I just um, I think I need to mention that some key points. So, on the standard relevance theoretic view, irony is a type of echoic use of language. And an utterance is echoic if it is um, a representation of another representation rather than a representation of a state of affairs, and it communicates an attitude. So uh, we can uh, use this example again. We all miss face-to-face -face faculty meetings as an ironic utterance. It echoes a thought attributed to a group of faculty members, possibly, who are unhappy about online meetings. And this utterance expresses a dissociative attitude to that idea. So we can say, following um, uh, Wilson and Sperber, that communicating the attitude is the key cognitive effect uh, uh, brought about by ironic utterances. Uh, also, uh, it has to be emphasized that the, the key notion in the treatment of irony is that of interpretive resemblance. And uh, so, so we can imagine how it works. We have here uh, this potential faculty member who might have expressed this idea overtly, or maybe she, she just this, this idea is attributed to her. Um, uh, that face-to-face -face meetings are better for some reason than online meetings. Maybe they provide more room for discussion or who knows, okay? And uh, so when th this, is, this is clearly a, like a full-fledged mental representation with, with the, the, that carries certain um, uh, propositional meaning and, and implications. And um, uh, when we have this ironic utterance uh, spoken by some other faculty member, we all miss face-to-face -face faculty meetings. Um, there is interpretive resemblance between this utterance or the proposition expressed by this utterance and the thought uh, attributed to this, well, target of irony. Uh, so interpretive um, resemblance occurs between propositions. Well, in the case of uh, individual uh, concepts like helpful or helpfully, it is hard to, uh, to talk about interpretive resemblance uh, because, uh, because there, is no, there is no proposition. So, so I, f I find it difficult to, to come up with an idea like the helpful or helpfully, what does it interpretively resemble if this is a single concept? Uh, well, in some other approaches to irony, uh, for instance, I'm, I'm referring to here to one Neo-Gricean uh, approach to irony um, by Deno. Uh, such um, ironies carried by individual words are uh, discussed um, as a separate category of irony. So, for instance, this author distinguishes uh, five types of irony, and one of them is that the one that I marked in yellow, local lexical meaning reversal. So in her model, irony is defined generally in terms of meaning reversal, and there are different kinds of reversal, reversals, and one of them is this local lexical meaning reversal. Much as this uh, approach is, um, you know, very neat because it distinguishes certain classes of irony, I, I find it hard to accept because I don't find it explanatory, because there is no mechanism uh, given. Um, besides, we have to keep in mind that relevance theory is largely a deflationary uh, approach to various uh, phenomena, and I strongly believe there is no need to distinguish types of irony, because even if there are different manifestations of, uh, of irony, it is not a homogeneous phenomenon, th there is likely to be a continuum of cases rather than uh, separate uh, classes. So I strongly believe that various uses of irony differ along some parameters such as ludicrousness or inadequacy, salience of echo, attribution of echo, source of echo, but these are uh, like um, 
and uh, all these parameters can be exploited to uh, to different degrees and uh, this does not result in like separate classes of irony uh, um, um, okay so having said this as a some kind of you know motivation further motivation i would like to um uh, to present to to return to the notion of interpretive resemblance uh, and illustrate it with another a very well-known example. I left my bag in the restaurant and someone kindly walked off with it, uh, this time from Wilson and Sperber uh, in 2012, and to uh, present a quotation from this very paper uh, with the, 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 the point of the irony is to indicate that a proposition the speaker might otherwise be taken to endorse that the person who took her back behaved kindly is ludicrously inadequate here because of its falsity. So I underlined, the, the emphasis is mine, the word proposition, uh, because we, we need to have this proposition in order to, um, to ground this interpretive resemblance into, into something. Uh, now, so moving on uh, um, to irony signaled by um, individual uh, words, I would like to uh, propose a tentative analysis. Uh, so first, let us uh, note that possibly the assumption that the bank clerk shut the door in my face with, without helpfully is an explicature endorsed by the speaker. Uh, um, the word helpfully, when it is when it is used in this utterance, it has to gain certain prominence, maybe by focal stress, maybe by uh, tone of voice, some other paralinguistic signals, in order for its um, inadequacy to become prominent. Well, if this word was used descriptively and adequately, uh, marking a, a prominence on, on, on it would probably result in its high informativeness. Or, or in other words, the, there would be an expectation that this word is the main source of relevance in these actions. And we can say that the assumption would be formed, the, the, the clerk's behavior was helpful Okay, so here I hope you can see the analogy with, with Sperber and Wilson's uh, analysis of kindly here, right? So there is this proposition that uh, the person behaved uh, kindly, okay? So uh, what I'm saying here once again is that um, granting a certain prominence to this adjective uh, results in creating an assumption the clerk's behavior was helpful. If this is a you know, normal um, uh, uh, communication in good uh, faith, that uh, behavior was indeed helpful, then this is a descriptive assumption. Now, if helpful um, uh, was part of an ironic use, this very assumption is also formed, but um, it is meta-represented. It is a meta-representation. So the clerk's behavior was, was um, helpful, is a meta-represented assumption which echoes common expectations or social norms on the typical behavior of clerks or people in general who, as we all know, uh, should be helpful rather than uh, unhelpful. Thus, we can say that irony here relies on the interpretive resemblance between this assumption and the thought and opinion echo, right? Then the, we sort of grasp uh, or we ground uh, the, the interpretive um, uh, resemblance in this um, meta-represented assumption that the clerk's behavior, behavior was helpful. I put a question mark here. Uh, Maybe this is one of the explicators of the of the actions. I don't know to what extent this this um, this is controversial or or, or not. But but actually, I, I'd be very happy to to be able to uh, uh, put forth uh, this uh, this view that this is indeed one of the explicators of the actions. Uh, if it if it's communicated in good faith, and and if not, it's just a meta-represented assumption. Uh, now. 
there are some other cases of irony signaled by an individual word, and sometimes this uh, word or individual phrase is in the referential position. Can we extend the same, the same kind of analysis? So here's an example. Uh, your best friend wants to talk to you. Well, your best friend is used ironically. Well, we can say by the same token, if some prominence is given to your best friend, then the utterance communicates the assumption, uh, why is the hearer's best friend? Which echoes the assumption attributed to the hearer or someone else that X is a friend of the hearers. Okay, so in the same way, if it is used uh, ironically, it is meta represented and it echoes this, this assumption that X is a white is, is, is a friend of the hearers. Well, it doesn't seem to be a huge problem that this is part of the assertion itself and it is a referential expression because referential expressions may not be used literally in other cases, such as, for instance, in uh, metonymy. Well, there is one more example that I would like to share with you. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm um, actually, I've, I have drawn this example um, from a paper by Wyszlicki, who discusses uh, cases of the so-called scare quotes. And here's one. The president is breaking the constitution when uh, this use of the president is meant to signal ironically that the, you know, the president is, is not um, fulfilling his role as a president in, in a, you know, the way it is expected. So if we applied the same reasoning, we would end up with a meta-represented assumption that Z is a president. But this clearly does not work in this case because Z is a president. So it is not a meta-represented um, as an assumption, but simply a descriptive um, assumption if somebody is a president. But let us note that such cases uh, have to be indicated by quotation marks or specific paralinguistic cues because otherwise they would not be perceived as ironic. And indeed, it is only possible to use the president ironically uh, if it's not only echoic but directly quotational as that there has to be an exchange, there has to be a reference to a specific actions to linguistic use, as is there's this dialogue, the president is so good looking and somebody answers the, the president is breaking the constitution. I, I, th th there are no uh, special marks in, in the slide, but so, so it makes it look odd, but I hope it sort of emphasizes the point. So alluding to the fact that this individual is commonly referred to as president is not sufficient to make this actions ironic. What we need is actually quotational use. Now, what is the difference between a friend and a president? Well, briefly speaking, uh, the classifying somebody as a friend or a kind person, helpful person is some kind of a more of a subjective decision. Whereas uh, classifying somebody as a president relies on this person's um, meeting some like more objectively defined criteria. Uh, I'm speeding up a little bit. Uh, so um, we've, we've, we've got this um, criterion for, for distinguishing the, 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 the cases which, which can be analyzed uh, via interpretive resemblance and cases which, can be, uh, which have to be analyzed via metalinguistic resemblance and in terms of this subjective or objective um, classification within a certain group of individuals. And we can say that such cases as the latter in relevance theoretic terms exploit metalinguistic resemblance and are a case of parodic irony. Uh, let me just add briefly that this, I, I suspect the, the you know, subjectivity, objectivity, this, this is another continuum possibly. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if, the, if there were cases in between, but that's not my goal um, to, um, mention them uh, right now because this is more like you know work in progress okay so just concluding briefly irony carried by individual words that this phenomenon is not uh, homogeneous 
Some cases appear to draw on interpretive resemblance and others on metalinguistic resemblance. Interpretive resemblance holds between an assumption triggered by the prominence given to the ironic word, such as the, the clerk was helpful, and the representation attributed to some source. The metalinguistic cases are clearly parodic as they are restricted to clearly quotational contexts. Okay, and here are my references. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Agnieszka, for this illuminating talk and for very nice examples. And now questions and comments are welcome. So please go ahead. Okay, I will stop sharing. We've got, uh, yes, Diana, please. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask you a question about the analysis that you gave of the um, um, helpfully example. Um, in discussing this example, at some point you mentioned the fact that there is an explicature that is endorsed by the speaker, that is that the bank clerk shut the door in my face. And I was wondering whether you could elaborate a bit more on the distinction between um, these cases of um, irony that is triggered by single words with the other um, cases of irony that you mentioned at the beginning, with respect to the kind of explicatures that are available or not, con communicated or not uh, in these two cases. Um, mm -hmm. thanks. Okay, thank you very much for the question. Well, it, it generally it is assumed that in, in such cases as we all love faculty meetings, there is, um, and if it's used ironically, there is no explicature communicated because the proposition expressed, whatever it is, is, is um, immediately meta represented. So this is just directly a pointer to, uh, to some other representation which is being echoed. Uh, the, actually, the um, reason why those um, cases like helpfully, kindly um, are problematic is, is, um, is that the proposition ex expressed seems, seems to be split between something that is genuinely communicated and therefore kind of explicature and, and this um, uh, what is triggered by, by, by a single word which which is not endorsed, which is not communicated. And uh, I said, I'm not so certain about it, but like um, mm, there's been some discussion in relevance theory, whether uh, there is the, like a, the explicature or explicatures of an utterance. So maybe in such cases, like with this, the, we, we um, it, it's not so, um, outrageous to, to, to postulate that this, um, uh, like one of the explicatures of the utterance, um, or sorry, no, maybe not explicatures, um, because I, um, I, I uh, actually, uh, I talked about both, you know, like helpfully being used as a descriptive um, an, an, uh, um, adverb simply, right? Non-ironic, in which case there would be an explicature. The, the clerk was helpful, the clerk's behavior was helpful one of the explicatures of this non-ironic utterance, right? I wanted to make this parallel. Um, whereas in an ironic use, there would also be an, an assumption, okay? Not explicated, but just an assumption would be created like the uh, clerk's behavior was helpful, but this would be immediately meta-represented as are propositions in ironic utterances and it would serve the purpose of of you know being the uh, echo trigger uh, so to speak okay so so th this would be like exactly the the somewhat you know non prototypical case but there something is communicated explicitly in this ironic utterance but this is like everything minus uh, minus this uh, th this irony trigger the the word I hope I made myself clear. Thank you. Uh, yes, we've got seven minutes for more questions. Deirdre, please. 
I'm afraid you need to unmute yourself. Yes, that shows how inexpert I'm at this. Uh, I thought that was a really interesting talk. And it's actually not something that I'd thought much about. I like these examples where you, the irony takes scope over a single word or a single phrase. And I agreed with you about all that. Um, I hadn't seen that there was such a problem because I thought, I was sort of assuming that like uh, any sort of quotation, um, it can take scope over a part of the utterance or the whole utterance. So I hadn't got much further than thinking about that. I think you were saying that in the kindly, helpfully cases, um, there's prosodic prominence on the word. Did you say that? Because I don't think that's true, actually. In I don't know. I said there might be, but I'm also uh, uh, ready to admit that uh, this, this um, uh, because th this is always optional. Yeah, uh, and as as a marker of irony, but but I I would I would agree that just the inadequacy of yeah. of this adverb is enough of a, of a signal for for irony to be triggered. I, I think that's right. That that uh, and certainly when I use those, it's sort of very much under my breath the uh -huh. actual kindly bit, uh -huh. the, the adverb itself. So I would I would keep the prominence out of it, but. And so then I think you're right that it has to trigger thoughts of the norm, which is being violated. And as you say, the norm is about behavior in general. Um, and so you have to get from, uh, you, you, one has really to think about explicatures at that point. And I, I hadn't actually thought about it. I just thought your irony could take one thing out of the scope of the assertion um, mm -hmm. and uh, you, uh, you'd interpret it from there. But I liked the distinction you made between the echoic cases and the parodic cases. Um, the example that I've always used is someone says, look at that sweet little doggy. And I say, uh, that sweet little doggy just bit through my motorcycle boots or something okay. like that, where it's a clear quotation. And that does, it, starts, it feels genuinely metalinguistic, whereas some of them are more conceptual. So I think you've raised a lot of really interesting uh, ideas. I actually remember Manuel um, raising that issue about the scope of of attitudes in something he published once on on uh, expletives or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. Where uh, and he raised that general gen, gen, general issue: how do you determine the scope and what happens? Um, so I think it is a general issue, and I, I really like the way you you raised it. And that I haven't got much con to contribute beyond that, but I enjoyed it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we have any other questions? Please go ahead. We still have three minutes. Um, Daniel? Sure. I, I'd add us a short one if there's, if there's a moment. Um, um, I, following up on what uh, Deirdre has commented, um, I really like the idea that uh, uh, that we can preserve uh, some some portion of the explicature as being asserted, and yet in, in removing a certain piece thereof uh, uh, in the scope of irony. But I'm kind of confused about the president example uh, or the little doggy example, uh, in the sense that the entire explicature is asserted. So then what is what is being like I, I'm kind of, kind of confused exactly how your analysis will, will well, this is, what's triggering uh, irony then in that case thank you very much it's it's pre pre this, because this is not like an echoic in this case more but like a like a parodic that metalinguistic observation that someone's use of the term president is um, even though it meets the, the formal criteria, it's it's uh, inadequate. Okay, so so th this really fu functions functions differently because like a like a parody or or um, meta linguistic comment imitation of someone else's the use of the language, which I consider to be uh, you know uh, worthwhile. Of, of you know for ironic treatment because it's, it's just raises my objections the way you speak about this guy as president mm -hmm. and would that would that example with the president or or Dieter's example of the little doggy would that fall then under 
the 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 neo gracian uh, uh, approach to irony that you were that you were polemicizing with or would that be that's not even irony for them um, i'm not sure because this uh, this is not discussed by uh, by them it's it's the uh, actually in the uh, book i mentioned by the, by Dinner, the uh, she she used a Deidre's um, example with one of those, you know, helpfully or kindly. And mm. that's the only one discussed. So I'm simply not sure. Very interesting. So, so like a continuum of examples, basically. Yeah, I guess. That's what... I'd be grateful, yes, if, if you could, you know, like share some, some authentic attested examples. Uh, I'd, I'd be, you know, very grateful. So please, everyone, I really appreciate. Mm, I'm afraid I'm afraid the time is almost up. So thank you very much, Agnieszka, once again. Uh, thanks for the questions from the audience. And now uh, the floor goes to uh, Laisa Ellis.